Prayer is the answer to every problem in life. It puts us in tune with the divine wisdom, which knows how to adjust everything perfectly. So often, we do not pray in certain situations because from our standpoint, the outlook is hopeless. But nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is so entangled that it cannot be re remedied. No human relationship is too strained for God to bring about reconciliation and understanding. No habit so deep, rooted, that it cannot be overcome. No one is so weak that he cannot be strong. <clears throat> no one is so ill that he cannot be healed. No mind is so dull that it cannot be made brilliant. <clears throat> Whatever we need, if we trust God, he will supply it. And everything, and if anything is causing worry or anxiety, let us stop rehearsing the difficulty and trust God for healing, love, and power. So whoever gave it to me, thank you. And I wanted to share it with you as well. Very, very positive statement on prayer and the power of it. Okay, today we're looking at persevering prayer. That means don't, don't stop. We keep praying. Because last time we looked at uh, united prayer, and that goes along with persevering prayer. They both are important. So, there's a text in, in Luke 18, 1. Jesus gave an illustration, and he began it by saying, he gave a parable. It says that he spoke a parable to them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Faint means give up. Now, the word prayer there, that's right, thank you. <laughs> Barbara's reminding me to pray when talking about prayer. <laughs> Uh, I get so caught up in it. <laughs> yeah. I thank the Lord for everyone you and stay on track. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you're such an understanding Father. And thank you that we do have the privilege of prayer as we begin our meal. We ask that you will draw near through your spirit and open our understanding to the wonderful blessing of prayer and the importance of persevering in prayer and not to quit. So we thank you for this privilege and for your promise to be with us in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Okay. Now things will go really well. Okay, so like Jesus said here, men ought to pray and not to faint. The Greek word, remember in the Greek, there's sort of two basic verb forms. One is a point in action time, once it's over. And the other is ongoing continuous action. Now we don't get that in English. Greek is a more exact language. And the word for prayer here is to keep on praying. Not, don't stop. Keep, yes? When I was in the Sabbath school class at Peoria one Sabbath, we were talking about prayer, and I mentioned how, uh, how I prayed daily for my children mm -hmm. and everything. And this one man spoke up and he said, What's the matter with you? Did just Pray about the same thing over and over and over. He said, don't you have any faith? It says, ask and it shall be given. But this blew my mind. He doesn't know the Greek word for ask because the Greek word there is keep on asking. It really is. It's not the point in time ask. It's keep on asking. Yeah, there's a lot of folks that are a little twisted on prayer. You just kind of say, oh, okay, thanks. Move on. Probably not going to change his mind. Uh, but no, he's, he's definitely off. That um, According to the Bible, we should keep praying. That's what Jesus said here. Because this was a parable where someone kept coming to the judge, I think, wasn't it? And kept bugging him until he finally gave what he, what he wanted. Okay, George Mueller. I, I don't know if, how familiar you are with George Mueller. He, uh, he was called by God to actually give, end up giving up everything he had to do an orphanage work in England. And there are stories, on, you know, if you've ever looked them up um, on the internet or somewhere and read some stories about George Mueller, um, he never told people of his need. He always took the need to the Lord. 
And like they'd be sitting at their, their dinner table and no food. <laughs> and they'd have prayer and blessing, thanking God for what he has provided. And some would knock on the door and there was food. I mean, you know, God doesn't call all of us to live like that. But what I have observed through the years, there are certain people God calls to use as an example for something. There are some people he used, he really gives them the gift of giving. And like the lady who gave the widow's might. And, you know, Christ said she gave more than everybody. Because she gave out of her need, not out of her abundance. Now most of us, I would say, probably give out of our abundance. Meaning, we're giving what God's asking. But by giving, we're probably going to have enough money to pay the rent or the house payment or to have food. So we're paying out of our abundance. And that's okay. But some people God chooses to use an ex as an example of what he can do if necessary. So in that case, it's like George Mueller was, was like this when it, when it came to um, this orphanage work and depending on God 100%. And I tell people that's the same way. If we have a financial need, don't broadcast it. You know? Um, I, I guess I'd put it this way. Be sure it's God that's convicting you to share it with somebody. Because we want, you know, take it first to God. Because I've seen it in my own life. God can put it on someone's heart without you even talking to them. And they can say, you know, I'm kind of impressed that that happened to us and we had to choose between rent and tithe one time. And we didn't let anybody know. We chose to pay tithe. And uh, didn't have the money for rent and, uh, during a certain period of time. And somebody came over just out of the blue and said, you know, someone gave me this for you. And it was just what we needed. So who gets the glory then? God does. So it, that's what God wants us to do is take these things to the Lord in prayer. But it doesn't mean we never share our concerns with one another. Just be sure we're under the Spirit's guidance when it comes to what we share. And so George Mueller, he said this. It is not enough to begin to pray, nor to pray right, nor is it enough to continue for a time to pray. But we must patiently, believing, continue in prayer until we obtain an answer. And he knew what he was talking about, believe me. So, great Christians of the past, they all understood the power of prayer. As I mentioned to you, two things you've discovered. When you read of the Christian biographies, great Christians of the past, they understood the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they understood the power of prayer. Every one of them. And George Mueller certainly understood the power of prayer. And then here's this verse that we were just referring to a little, little bit ago, Acts 7, 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. Every one of these are continuous action verbs. Keep on asking, keep on knocking, keep on seeking, continuous action verbs. And you don't get that in the English, you have to know the Greek, or compare with other scriptures to get the idea. And many prayers will go unanswered if we don't keep praying. And we'll get in a little bit of why that, why that is. Ellen White um, counsels educators and teachers she, you read this, she said, I asked the angel why there was no more faith and power in Israel about the church. He said, you let go of the arm of the Lord too soon. Press your petitions to the throne and hold on by strong faith. The promises are sure. Believe you receive the things you've asked for and you shall have them. So do not let go of the arm of the Lord too soon. Don't quit until you get the answer. Now, I find this interesting. Uh, there's this experience of Jesus healing a blind man. <coughs> you know, Jesus, here he's God in the flesh. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, of course. His ministry, I'm sure, is the most powerful ministry of any individual that's ever walked this earth. Powerful ministry. 
And I find it interesting here in this situation where he healed a blind man. You find this in Mark 8, in verse 22. It says, and, and he came to Bethesda, and they brought a blind man to him and besought him to touch him. Because word had gotten out. You know, if, if Jesus can just touch you, you could be healed. Or there was the lady when Christ was in the crowd, and she touched the hem of his garment. And she was healed. Um, she believed. Well, they brought in there. This was a friend of theirs, a blind man. Said, Lord, just touch him. He'll be healed. And so he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. Now, it's interesting. Jesus did not ever try to make a great show of healing. Um, sometimes it was a People were aware of it, but a lot of times not. And I found that when people come for healing, um, to me it's it's appropriate, you know, like go to the office, you know, somewhere. I wouldn't be totally comfortable praying. You know, if it happened naturally and the Spirit led to pray for someone right now, right here for healing, yes, don't have a problem with that. But you want to be sure it's in the Spirit's guidance because it isn't to show things if you what I mean there. Um, so he took them and he took them out of town and then it says when he had spit on his eyes well, that's an unusual way of healing someone and put his hands on him he asked him if he saw if he saw what if he could see. He looked up and said I see men as trees walking. Not quite fully healed yet but that's Jesus. I talk about power. Jesus had all the power. So he, and so he, he still couldn't see good. So what did Jesus do? After that, he put his hands again on his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. So even on physical healing, nothing wrong with praying more than once. And I've had many times that that was the case. Um, you, I find it interesting. Uh, God doesn't limit Himself on any one method. I discovered that on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When I first got into the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I thought, well, maybe there has to be laying on of hands. But then I discovered, no, it doesn't have to be. Uh, a lady came after one of our meetings, and on Wednesday, and she said that let the Last, the last week, she said, she went home, prayed for the Baptist Holy Spirit, and the greatest peace came over she ever felt. So the Lord used that to start educating me. Oh, okay, you don't have to have laying on of hands. And when you read the book of Acts, there wasn't always laying on of hands. The day of Pentecost, there wasn't laying on of hands. He came. So you're claiming a promise. Well, the same for healing. Um, here you see Jesus... Uh, Spit on and put on the eyes, alive basically. There are times he spoke it. Remember, the centurion came and Jesus says, Okay, I'll go home with you. And he says, No, 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 no. I'm a soldier with soldiers under me. I'm an officer. I just say, Do it, they do it. I understand authority. You got authority. All you got to do is speak the word. <laughs> Remember what Jesus said? I haven't found such faith in Israel. That man had faith. And so there, Jesus just spoke the word. Other times he laid his hands on them. Other times he anointed with oil. In my personal experience, most of the healings I've seen was with laying on of hands. But we also know that James um, said, you know, uh, one way of praying for healing, call the elders, anoint with oil. And many times we do that in the church too, which is very appropriate. But again, God doesn't limit himself. If, if it's a prayer of faith, I, I do remember a person bringing prayer and healing. This was a situation where we did have a small group. And I've never seen anything like this before or since. There was a lady in our group, and she had severe arthritis. She had been healed of arthritis in her back, a few other places. But for some reason, her hand wasn't healed. 
and we were in our little a little group of prayer, and her hand was red and swollen with arthritis. And the Lord convicted me right then and there, pray for that hand. Like I said, I've never done this before or after. And I felt very strong about this. So I had her hand and I prayed and I didn't quit. I kept commanding in the name of Christ the spirit of infirmity causing the arthritis to part and claim in the name of Jesus the healing. I did that for several minutes. I just felt convicted. Do not quit. And before our very eyes, the red went away, the swellness went down, and her hand was normal. Amen. Now, I've never seen anything before or after. But that's what God wanted to do in that situation. So there's a place to uh, don't give up when it comes to, um, to, to prayer. Um, and I think also of my wife Patty, her kidney, she had one kidney removed, a congenital problem. And uh, then we discovered she had glomeruli nephritis in the other one. Well, if she lost that kidney, that's it. Kidney dialysis. Um, and she saw her father on kidney dialysis. He had passed away. So it was her call. We had gone to the doctor and they recommended steroids. Because that's an autoimmune disease. You know, the, the antigens or they called, they were attacking the kidney. There's like a, some kind of netting or something there. And it punches holes in it. <laughs> so. It would destroy your kidney. Um, but she decided no. Uh, she wanted to make it a matter of prayer. And we did go to the ch second opinion, the chief of the nephrology department at UCLA uh, Medical Center and steroids too. But we made it a matter of prayer. And it took a year, almost exactly one year. I remember that day, went to the doctor and she went in and came out and she said, doctor says I'm here. Now that didn't happen immediately. It happened and it took one year. And we were in um, California at the time. We, and then we, you know, we're here in Arizona, I was pastoring, and then we went over to Connecticut. And when we went to the doctor in Connecticut, and, you know, they do annually blood tests and all. And he looked at her, her whatever test they do for the kidney, and he said, now you said you had kidney disease before? I said, yeah. He says, I show no evidence of it. He says, usually I find evidence of it. No evidence of it. And she went to a specialist here one time, and the lady said, your one kidney is, is functioning, I forget what percent, way high. Much higher than many people that have two kidneys at her age. So, God healed that when he did a pretty good job. Um, now, I haven't seen everyone healed. Um, you know, my wife still has some issues with her legs. So you leave it with God. You pray about it. You trust God in it. Sometimes he chooses to intervene. Sometimes he doesn't. I have the answer on that. <laughs> but I still pray in faith expecting to see healing. And uh, then we leave it with the Lord on that. But that's where we, you don't want to give up. If you don't see it happen right away, just trust him. And we know for sure we got some new bodies coming. And we're all going to be healed <laughs> in due time. So, um, the older I get, the more I look forward to that new body. Now, um, we got also in the area of um, prevailing prayer, persevering prayer. This, this text over in Genesis 32 about Jacob. Genesis 32. Here Jacob was fearful he was coming back to his brother who he had deceived and he got the birthright through the suffering. Um, and by the way, there's a good case of taking things in your own hands and not waiting on the Lord. Because remember, Jacob was a favor of his mother and uh, Esau was the favorite of his father. And it was the father who would pass on the birthright <coughs> blessing. And... Um, and we've got a water fella coming in again on Wednesday. Okay. <laughs> He's going to be bringing in some bubble water if you hear some noise. Um, and, and, and of course, Esau was born first, even though they were twins, so he had the right. 
and Jacob's mother wanted Jacob to get that birthright. So she decided about how to do it. Where she'd have waited in prayer on God, God would have worked it out because Jacob was the promised one. That was to get it. So there's again, waiting on God or taking it in our own hands. Don't get anxious. Uh, we may think we know how God wants to do it. Don't count on that. Just pray and, and wait for the Lord in these situations. And so his brother was quite upset over that. And now Jacob's coming back. He had to get away from the family and all. And you know the rest of the story there. Now he's coming back. And we read here in, in Genesis 32. And we begin with verse uh, 24. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him. He touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. And he said, as Jacob saying, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And the word Israel means Prince of God. If you look at your margin, uh, different margins, I'll tell you what that is. Um, now, could, you know, he's, he's basically wrestling with Christ, right? Could he have got away? Of course Christ could have. Very easily. But he didn't want to get away. He wanted him to, to wrestle with him. You know, to prevail with him. So there's again a good example of illustrating that. Do you want to be a prince of God? If you do, be one who prevails in prayer with God. That's what a, that's what a true Israelite is. Who prevail with God in prayer. Ellen White put it this way. Jacob prevailed because he was persevering and determined. His experience testifies to the power of importunate, meaning prevailing prayer. It is not that we are, it is now that we are to learn this lesson of prevailing prayer, of unyielding faith. You find that? We can yield our faith. We can give up on our faith if we stop praying. The greatest victories to the Church of Christ or to the individual Christians are not those that are gained by talent or education, by wealth or the favor of men. They are those victories that are gained in the audience chamber with God when earnest, agonizing faith lays hold upon the mighty arm of God. That's why you hear me say over and over, any blessings that's happening to this church is a result of prayer. Amen. And that's why I say don't quit praying. That's what allows God to pour the spirit on this church, on this congregation. It's not a matter of talent or anything else. It's, it's the power of prayer. Then she says, those who are unwilling to forsake every sin and seek earnestly for God's blessing will not obtain it. But all who will lay hold of God's promises, as did Jacob, and be as earnest and persevering as he was, will succeed as he succeeded. Um, again, all great Christians of the past were aware of the necessity of prevailing prayer. Absolutely necessary. Martin Luther, uh, and, you know, he was a major leader in the Protestant Reformation. She said, during the, Al the struggle at Augsburg, Luther did not pass a day without devoting three hours at least to prayer. And they were hours selected from those most favorable for study. So, Part of this, and I'll be talking about praying in the Spirit. Um, if you just say, okay, I'm going to pray for three hours, you're probably going to have a hard time doing it. But if the Spirit is moving on you, it's leading you to do that. Or if you practice praying, and there, there's something to be said for practice. If you practice praying, what will happen, your prayer life will probably get longer and longer. 
and longer. And we're going to be at, the, at our last session of this series. I'm going to talk about praying Bible verses. And that's very important. And we've got something special coming up for the month of September when you get your activities calendar and your prayer calendar. We've got some things there too that I'm excited about. I'm going to get into. Wesley Duell wrote, Satan fears prayer more than almost anything else we could ever do. Prevailing prayer, remember persevering, prevailing prayer, is potentially the greatest continuing threat to Satan that there has been since Calvary. So, you praying every day, powerful. Um, Ellen White wrote, wrote this. This is in um, Science of the Times, I guess, January 26, 1882. There's a need of prayer, earnest prevailing prayer. Our Savior has left precious promises for the truly penitent petitioner. Such shall not seek his face in vain. He's also, by his own example, taught us the necessity of prayer. Himself, the majesty of heaven. He often spent all night in communion with his Father. If the world's Redeemer was not too pure, too wise, too holy to seek help from God, surely weak, erring mortals have every need of that divine assistance. With penitence and faith, every true Christian will often seek the throne of grace that he may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I mentioned to you before about Charles Finney, uh, amazing evangelist and revivalist back in the 1800s. Um, he went in 1830, he went to Rochester, New York. 30,000 were converted in a year. Amen. 30,000. They said when he would come to town, the spirit was so strong that saloons would close. The dance halls would close. The spirit was so strong. And people would come out to his meetings. Just the Holy Spirit bring them. And when you read about him and the things he wrote, he attributed the success to the prayers of a minister, Abel Clary. A-B-E-L, the last name was Clary, C-L-A-R-Y. He said, that's why my meetings are a success. And what Abel Clary did, he never went to a meeting. He would go to a town where Charles Finney was, and he would give himself to prayer continuously. And he would prevail in prayer day after day after day after day after day for those meetings. Only man. <laughs> but he was a real prayer warrior. <laughs> And because of that, and like I say, Charles Finney attributes his success to that. And that's why I say the same thing here. Anything that's happening here that is good from God, that's the words through prayer. That's, that's where it comes from. It's also necessary for victory over sin. Remember Jesus, uh, read this in, in Matthew 4. Uh, Jesus had just been baptized in water and we're told when he was baptized in water, he prayed and then it says the Holy Spirit came down. So he had just been filled with the Spirit, anointed with the Spirit. Then it says in chapter 4 of Matthew, then was Jesus led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days, and by the way, when you read a fasting, it always includes prayer. And as I mentioned to you before, when you read about the church coming together to pray for Peter, or to pray for James and John, or in preparation for the day of Pentecost, it just says prayer, but it doesn't say fasting. It always included fasting. So Jesus would pray, he prayed and he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And he was hungry. Makes sense. <laughs> Hungry. Then the devil came and, of course, tempted him. And he had to trust his father to feed him. He didn't change those stones into bread. He could have, right? 
but he had to live like you and me. If we get in a tough situation, and we don't have the power to get ourselves out of it, we have to depend on our Father. Well, Jesus had to live that kind of life then. So in a sense, it was a double temptation. He could have done it, so he had to choose not to use his power to do it. How many times would we do that? <laughs> if we could deliver or something. And then choose to trust his Heavenly Father. Resist it. And by the way, uh, Satan will often attack your position with, with God. Because remember what he told uh, Christ. He says, if you be the Son of God, prove it. Has Satan ever came and attacked your position in Christ? You say you're really a Christian? You say you're going to go to heaven? Say the same attack. You attack your position in Christ. Well, throw back at him the word of God. <laughs> Just like Jesus did. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He tempts you, you're not forgiven. Don't argue with him. If I confess my sins, he's faithful to Jesse. We're going to talk about that, not this Sabbath, coming Sabbath, about the sword of the Spirit, a little more power in the word spoken. Amazing power. That's how Jesus overcame. And you know, it's interesting, I, I ran across this many years ago. I forget where I heard it. Christ was 40 days in the wilderness and tempted on appetite, number one. Uh, Jewish tradition is that Adam and Eve were 39 days in the garden before they yielded. I don't know if that's true or not, but I find it interesting. Christ went one more day <laughs> for the victory. Uh, like I say, I don't, I don't preach that as doctrine, but it's an interesting, it comes from Jewish tradition. Um, Ellen White wrote about this. Jesus died to make a way of escape for us, that by prevailing prayer, by His grace, we might overcome every temptation. Every um, subtle Snare. share of the adversary. Snare. 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 Why I misspelled that one, didn't I? <laughs> you got the book, don't you? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Every subtle snare of the adversary and at last sit down with him in the kingdom. And then the other one here, having access as we do to the source of all strength, why should we be content to remain so weak that we yield to temptations to the enemy? Having so great an assurance of power to enable us to overcome, why are we so faithless? Why do we not overcome every time we are tempted to be hasty in speech? You know, that's where we need the Spirit to give us a warning. Is that we're used to being hasty with our tongue, and say something we shouldn't. And we all can have that tendency. We need to make that special prayer, Lord. Guard my tongue. And, and he'll warn us. It takes a time a while. Sometimes before we learn that, we'll say something and then we'll oh, Sorry, Lord. I should have said that. And we may need to apologize to somebody for saying something. That's value too. But we learn. And what will happen, God will come along and then when we're at the point of... We can do it. The Holy Spirit warns us. Be careful here. You know what you've done before. So that's where the Spirit comes in to help us guard our speech. We should pay much pray. <laughs> we should pray much more than we do. In every hour of trial, we may find victory through the strength given in answer to prevailing prayer. And uh, I'm going to have a whole presentation on praying in the Spirit, but. We'll look a little bit at it, prevailing prayer in the Spirit. The last part, when Paul goes through the armor of God, the last thing he says there is praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We're to pray for one another. Persevering prayer for one another. In our personal prayer life, we should uplift our church members here. You may not mention them by name. There may be certain ones you mention by name who you know are having a difficult time. But others, God knows, you say, Lord, remember our, our congregation, our folks, whatever. However God leads you in that. What should we pray about in prevailing prayer? 
whatever the Spirit puts on your heart. Let me show you what to pray for. Pastor, excuse me, but <clears throat> Sally's having her surgery today on her aorta. Oh, Sally, you okay? Yeah. And we can have prayer for her before we... I think I can must have prayed in prayer this morning. Okay. So, well, at least we want to remember Sally's in, in prayer. Yes. So everyone remembers Sally. She's having her surgery day for uh, Andrew. Okay. Okay. Pardon? It's just a procedure to see what's happening. Oh, it's a procedure to see what is. Okay. Well, let's do remember her. That's good. An opportunity to prevail in prayer. I I've had people share cases with me when you pray for someone having surgery for the God to guide the doctor's hand that I know one case and I forget what the exact details were but the doctor was in doing a work and all of a sudden whatever that part was moved in place wow. <laughs> well prayer that's a good testimony to the doctor so oh, I always include you know I like to remember to include Lord guide the doctor guide them on their decisions and guide them on the procedure and bless the procedure. We talked about healing. I, I, you know, I've seen a lot of healings. I'm not against medical science. God's given us some knowledge there in medical science. I'm not against medication. But I do say and recommend ask God to bless any medication that you're taking. That'd be a good idea, man. <laughs> and if you shouldn't have it, Lord, give me wisdom. I shouldn't have this. He's concerned about all that kind of stuff. And when you're praying the will of God, well, you know it, it you know, the answer will come. Okay, um, how many things do you focus on? And maybe one, maybe two or three. I wouldn't say prevailing prayer is going to be on ten things. Prevailing prayer will generally be very focused. One or two, maybe three. And, and like the children, like we're talking about, marches. I'm sure all of us pray for our children and grandchildren every day. That's prevailing prayer for our, our children. Um, when do we pray uh, persevering prayer? Whatever comes to your mind. You may be driving the car, doing the dishes, who knows what you're doing. Uh, God will put it on your heart and you pray for it. And how long do you pray? Well, as long as you need to, to get the answer. Um, and you got we got a couple examples of Moses and Elijah. I like this uh, quote by Ellen White on Elijah. Uh, she said, "Had he given up in discouragement at the sixth time, his prayer would not have been answered. He persevered till the answer came." And you see that on the day of Pentecost, they prayed for ten days. <coughs> and uh, why are answers to prayer delayed? This is this example of Daniel. Remember when Daniel started praying? He prayed for 21 days. And um, here, is this is Daniel 10. The angel. Then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you did set your heart to understand and to chasten yourself before the Lord. Did you catch that? He didn't go with pride before the Lord. He went humbly before the Lord. Chase himself. Yes. Are you using prevailing and persevering? Yes. As the same thing. Yeah, meaning the same thing. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. He says, "Your words were heard." He prayed for twenty-one days, and I am come for thy word because you prayed. I've come. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. That's talking about Satan working through with the powers to stop. So, remember this, as I've shown you before, in my head, this is what it is. There's two powers that war behind the scenes. The power of God and the power of evil. The more you pray, the more the power of God can come. It's real. Your prayer keeps releasing God's power. And so the more that are praying together, there's more power. We looked at that last time. And the more you persevere, it keeps enabling God's power. 
And so Satan will resist. It's an actual physical resistance to God answering your prayer. That's why it's good to have others come together to pray and keep praying. It keeps releasing God's power to do that. And that's where I talk about we're in that spiritual warfare. And the disciples prayed for 10 days for the Baptist Holy Spirit. And they were also putting differences away among themselves. Because <clears throat> you remember what they were arguing about when they were going to the, the Passover, the First Communion, who's going to be the greatest. There was a lot of pride in those guys. I mean a lot of pride. Won the highest position. And that all had to be taken care of. And there's stuff in us too. And when we pray, we, you know, we, it, it's good to have that prayer. Search my heart, oh Lord. Was that Psalm 139 there? Search my heart. See if there's anything. Be sure our heart is right with God. And that opens the way for God to hear. And also it, it gives opportunity for us to develop faith. Um, and God may want to reveal something to us about himself. Remember Martha and Mary? Their brother Lazarus was dying. And they sent word to Jesus. Please come. If you will come, he will be healed. Right? They saw God do it. No question about it. I, I like a, an expression there when you're reading about Martha, I think, was talking to Jesus after he finally arrived. They said, well, we know whatever you ask the Father, he'll do it. That's quite a statement. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be nice if people looked at us that way? Not for our pride. Right. Not, not for us to get big-headed. But they realized <laughs> that we had a relationship with God that whatever we ask for, he seems to hear. Amen. Well, that's where we should be. Because he says, the works you do, I'll do. Jesus lives in us, you know. Um, so, in Martha and Mary's case, they were um, wanting Jesus to get there in, in time to heal. But he delayed. <clears throat> if I remember the story right, when Jesus got there, Mary didn't come out. I think she was a little upset. Martha came out. And, and um, you know, oh, we just could have been here, Lord, or, you know, our brother would be healed. Um, he says, yeah, but he'll be raised. He said, well, I know that she said. He says, yeah, but I'm the resurrection and the life. Amen. I don't just heal people. I raise it from the dead. <laughs> and that's what I want you to learn here. And he raised it from the dead. So sometimes God delays the answer because he wants us to learn something about himself maybe or whatever. Uh, and that was a powerful lesson uh, on that. And something else that's always kind of fascinated me, I remember, I don't recall if it was the case of Lazarus, but I know when he raised a little girl one time, the first thing he said, now this great miracle had just taken place. Amazing. And what does he say? She's hungry. Give her something to eat. I, I love that. <laughs> it shows you how caring God is. She's been dead, and he just raised her from the dead, and instead of everybody celebrating and jumping around and all that, hold it. She's hungry. Give her something to eat. That's, that's the kind of father we have. So there's that. And also, I, I like this statement. Um, about accumulating prayer. Remember those prayer bowls? Mm -hmm. We got a prayer bowl, right? That's where it comes from. Please don't forget to put the prayers in there. Don't forget to pray for the prayers in the prayer bowl. And don't forget to put the answers in the other bowl. <laughs> okay? I like what she said in, in uh, this statement. The revenue of the glory has been accumulating for the closing work of the third angel. Of the prayers that have been ascending for the fulfillment of the promise to send of the Holy Spirit, not one has been lost. So what does that tell me? She calls prayer revenue. Another word for revenue is money. You buy things with money. 
You can buy things from God with the right money. And what's the right money here? Prayer. Got that? The revenue has been accumulating. So you're putting money in the bank of heaven for whatever you're praying for. And the more you put in, same idea, the more you can get back. Very simple equation. So, let's see how you did on your lesson here. You got your lessons in front of you. And see what you got. Okay, how would you define persevering prayer? Praying for something until God gives the answer. You don't quit. You keep praying until God gives the answer. Don't stop. What did Jesus say about the importance of persevering prayer? He said Christians should persevere in prayer and not give up praying. There's a, uh, I don't know if I still have this DVD. There's a very powerful DVD by a pastor by the name of Jim Cimbala. He's the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle. They've got a music group. And when I was in Connecticut, um, they have a prayer meeting. I think their prayer meeting's on Tuesday, something like that. But I went down to one of their prayer meetings that I don't see, because it's a very powerful prayer. And um, when a lot of the churches back east, you don't have a lot of parking like we do here. Like our church in New Haven, we had in the back of the church just for maybe five cars, the rest was on the street. Um, but it doesn't seem to stop folks. They find ways to park. And his church down there at the Brooklyn Tabernacle, they're parking. He got to park all over the place. And we went in that church, and it's a big church, packed on a Tuesday night. And uh, he's got a couple books out that are quite good on the Holy Spirit and prayer. But he's got a DVD on prayer. Very powerful one. I'll see if I can find it. Um, maybe one of you have it. It's, uh, it's, it's a very good one on, on prevailing prayer. He, he shares the testimony. Well, he kind of starts off by, it was what it was. He, he was speaking at some kind of big gathering. I think it was in Indianapolis for music ministry. And then when he was speaking, the Lord put on his heart that our church is not to be a church of music. On a couple of things. Our church is be a, a house of prayer. Then he gave a personal testimony praying for his daughter. <coughs> and what she had gone out of faith in. So it's a very powerful video on prayer. I think I can find it. Um, what did Ellen White write about the necessity of persevering prayer? There is a need of prayer, earnest prevailing prayer. So we need it. An earnest prevailing prayer, not just formal. If you really have a burden for it, it'll be earnest. <laughs> and it's the Spirit that'll give us that earnestness. Give biblical examples, examples of persevering prayer. Jesus healing the blind man. Jacob wrestling with the angel. You also got Elijah praying for the rain. Yeah. You've got the disciples before the day of Pentecost. They prayed for 10 days. You know, it's, it's been a real blessing in the last 18 months to be here and the pastor. Um, it's been exciting to see what God's been doing in answer to prayer. If we will get even more earnest in prayer, we're going to be amazed if we're going to see the next 18 months. Amen. We are. <laughs> I don't know what it's going to be, but we're going to see 
the power of God moving as maybe none of us have ever seen before. Amen. And that'll be an answer to prayer. And that's why I'm excited as, you know, we're studying it now and what Ike's been doing on our prayer ministries and, and you know, and when we finish this series, we're going to give you out something as we begin September for some, adding some prayer focus to what we're already doing in prayer. And if we will take this seriously for the rest of this year and then beyond, there's no limit to what God can do. And it's exciting to see what he's going to do. Because you can't guess. You don't, and we got, we got a general idea. But we don't have any idea of what we will see him do. But we will know it's him. And my prayer is that, you know, a lot of us are a little over <laughs> and serving the Lord, but that we would see something we've never seen in His power. Amen. Um, that's really my prayer. So, it'll come. Number five, is persevering prayer necessary for victory over sin? Explain your answer. Yes. It strengthens us spiritually. So that's part of the reason God delays, is for our strengthening. And strengthens our hold on God. Many times we appreciate the answer more if he delays. And if he delays, sometimes we desire more. And all these little things work in us. What role does the Holy Spirit play in persevering prayer? The Spirit convicts us what to pray for. When we should pray and how long we should pray. That's the key, being praying in the Spirit. That's why, again, you hear me say over and over and over and over, every day ask God to fill you with the Spirit. You do that. You got to do that. And that will affect everything else. That's number one. Well, number one is being converted. <laughs> Born again. Number two is being filled with spirit. Seven, in persevering prayer, what should we pray for and for how long? Um, get back to that. Pray for what spirit puts on our heart and for as long as the spirit convicts us to pray. Kind of similar to the other question. List some reasons why God may delay answering one's prayers. Why you got it? Satan resists. Change may be needed to take place in us. Delay enables us to develop enduring faith. We may learn something new about God. And the prayers may need to accumulate. Yes, I mean. I have found in my own personal life that many times when God delays answering my prayer, it's really right at the last second before I go off the cliff. There's no doubt in my mind that it is the answer to God. That he did it. Yeah, I've, I've got a. I know you probably heard me there's a sermon again. Fourth Watch God. That's the last watch of the night. And quite often he's a fourth watch God. It comes right when you're ready to go off the cliff. <laughs> yeah. And you know it's him. Yeah, exactly right. Okay, well, next time, pray the promise. Same time, same place. <laughs> and uh, let's have prayer. Where are we going? Father, we thank you for the time we've had to study. And Lord, I pray that what we looked at today will not just be words, but your spirit will take these words that come from the Bible and bring strong conviction on our heart. May we truly become men and women that persevere in prayer, that become strong prayer warriors. As I know, Father, you want to do even more amazing things in our life and in our church here. And I pray that you will lead us in 
being prayer warriors, praying together, praying in the Spirit, that you'll be able to do what it's your desire to do. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Okay.